All right, okay, so let's get started. So to review what we did last time, right? So for the past week or so, what we did was we can, if you give us a transmission line, right? So this is a section of a line. Then this section looks like some resistor, some inductor, let's say, and some shunt capacitance. So this is a section of the transmission line. Say so some delta x length of the line. Then what we can compute is we can compute something like small z and small y. This is the impedance per meter. These are per, I say per meter. Parameters of this line, right? So for a small section of line, from the physics of the line, we know how to compute these parameters. And uh, when we go from a small section of the line, when we go from that towards a entire line, if we look at the aggregate model of the line, then we have the pi model. Okay. And the pi model is given by something like the prime, y prime over two, y prime over two. Okay. So this is the entire line now. This is no longer a section of the line, but the entire line together model as a circuit element. Okay. And uh, if you, you know, if we could do the calculation, it turns out Z prime, so this capital Z prime relates to the per unit. So you can think of the small z times L times a correction factor, right? And this correction factor depends on the hyperbolic sign of right? So it depends on the sort of parameters. And uh, we get this if you actually solve the differential equation. Okay? So without solving the differential equation, we just have to remember that the uh, the aggregate, the lumped parameter, is a per unit per, per unit length parameter times the length of the line times some correction factor, and the y prime the same thing. Y for y prime we have basically the small y times l over two multiplied by another correction factor. Right, so always tank gamma L over two divided by gamma L over two. So you can find this you can find these equations in the slide and in the book. And to use them, we just need to remember that uh, uh, it's not always just the per meter per meter number times a lot. Right? There are, for long enough lines, you need a correction factor. And uh, whether we need correction factor or not, basically depends on the length of the line. Okay, so for a fairly short line, the correction factors are almost one. For a long line, then these do matter. Okay. Any questions about these? Any question about the pi model? So you see pi model a lot. Okay, so almost always when we do the system level calculation, we convert every line to this equivalent pi model. So, and uh, you know, you see, and the, this is often stated. This is often used without stating. It. So when you look, work with the software, when you read a paper, when you look at a book, almost always it says the line has the following parameters. It's almost always given in the pi model. So we use pi model as the equivalent circuit model we we'll use. And uh, then the y prime number, you know, y prime may be small, may be large. So often for short lines, we'll ignore y prime. Okay. If the line's short enough, y prime is typically small, we just ignore it. For long lines and for high voltage lines, y prime does matter. Okay. And another thing to keep in mind is these are the hyperbolic signs and tangents we're taking. Okay. So be sure to use the right equation. Right. This is sine h and tan h. Okay. So it's an easy mistake is just use sine instead of sine h. Which is, which is not right. 
okay, you'll get very weird numbers if you sign a sign page. All right, so these are just some uh, equations to remember. So if there's no questions unless today we'll finish looking at transmission lines. We'll basically look at the what limits transfer of power on a transmission line. Okay, we'll think about you know we'll think about stability limits, and uh, when we offer the system, really it becomes complicated because we cannot set arbitrarily large amount of current on a transmission line. Okay, so that's actually a lot of complexity comes from there. So a transmission line has limits. Yeah, so we'll look at where they come from. Then we'll look at the generator models. We'll basically do a brief review of generator models. Then we'll go to a large scale power system. We'll, we'll start to see some uh, matrix notation, how do we describe system like this. Okay. All right, so let's look at today. So today, if you will look at the transmission limits. So let's see. So today we'll look at limits of transmission lines. Okay. Okay, transmission line limits basically says if I have a transmission line, so let's just draw one line for this simplicity. I'm trying to send power as the S in as received. Then the question is, how much power can I send along this line? Right? What's limiting me from sending too much power on this line? And turns out the sort of the most uh, straightforward limit we have is the thermal limit. Right? Thermal limit means that we don't want to heat the line up too much. If you heat the line up, it will expand. And uh, well, basically, you know, once it expands, if there's wind, it will touch a tree or touch something else. That's what we don't want. Okay, so thermal limit is something we always have. But most times in practice, we don't hit the thermal limit. Or not often do we hit the thermal limit. Most times, it's limited by stability limits. Okay, so a lot of times, the lines from a thermal point of view, we don't hit it. And what stops us from sending power on the line is actually something called stability. Limit. And it has nothing to do with the material of the line or how much uh, heat it can tolerate. So today we'll have a, some little bit look like, uh, we'll, have, we'll look uh, briefly at the stability limits of the lines. And if you think about power transfer, for example, if you think of transferring power uh, from so most of the power in the West Coast flows from BC through Washington, Oregon to California. If you look at this power flow, this is normally limited by stability and not thermal limit. It's limited actually by, by the uh, dynamics of the power flow equations, not so much the thermal property of the line. So to analyze this, we'll assume a lossless line. Okay, and you'll see this assumption quite a bit whenever we work with stability limits or whenever we want to do large scale calculations. So this is actually an important statement we have. So if you read a paper, for example, on power stability, 90% of the paper will start by saying, we we'll assume lossless lines. Okay, they'll start to say, we we'll assume lossless lines and go from there. And the reason is one, there's a losses in transmission line are not very high. Okay, they're not very high because we, on purpose, we make the voltage very high. So the losses are quite uh, small compared to everything else. And losses really makes things easy to, to compute. Okay, losses makes our job really easy when we want to compute different things. Okay. So a lossless not line means the following. We have no resistance in the line. It will have no resistance in the line. So the line becomes some inductor and some two capacitors, two capacitors at the end of the line. Okay. And the, so this means all the R values are zero in the line. We don't consider loss. So just as a ballpark number, anybody know what percentage of power is lost in transmission line, in transmission systems? 
So you look at from the generator, cover transmission. So 1%, the chance is 1%, that's a little bit low, but it's around a few percent. So two, 3% or 1%, depending on the voltage. So most of the time, the loss in the transmission line itself is not very high. Okay? What's lost is more loss occurs in the distribution system. So once it gets to a substation, then once the voltage gets stepped down, and for example, it has to go through some underground cables or goes to overhead lines, but the voltage are lower, in those places, loss is significant. So you'll feel part of your bill actually pays for this loss. Very, very small part of your bill pays for the losses in the transmission system, in the high voltage system. Okay. So that, that's why for some system operators, this loss is actually not computed all that much. Basically, they just take this loss and they equally allocate to everybody. Okay. And the impact of this is small. The so loss of this lines typically is not a bad assumption at least as a first order model. It's not a, that bad of assumption. Okay, so let's look at what happens when we have a loss in this line. Okay. So what the thing we want to compute is the following. For given loss this line, we want to see how much power can I transmit from one end of the line to another end. Okay, so that's what we want to do. Right, so when we have a loss this line, so let's draw the, our line model here again. So we have, this is our pi model. So this is Jx prime. This is y prime over two, Jy prime over two. And the, let's say we have some voltages. So on this side, we have Vs, on this side, we have VR, so we have a sending end voltage and the receiving end voltage. Okay, we'll call this as why well. we use VS and VR. We'll use this as angle zero. Okay, well, well, so for, these are complex numbers, complex voltages we have to think about. So we need to pick some reference. Okay, we need to pick some reference voltage. Uh, we'll pick the receiving end to be reference voltage, meaning the angle is zero. Okay, we'll just pick this to be angle zero. And then for this end, we'll pick the sending voltage to be angle delta. Okay, we'll pick this to be angle Vs, angle delta. And then what we want to compute is we want, so we want to know what is SR. Okay, so what is the amount of power I can pull out, out of this transmission line if I have some sending voltage Vs and receiving voltage Vr. Okay. All right, so to compute SR, the equation we use is this is Vr Ir star. Okay. And now our goal is to compute Ir, right? Our goal is now to compute Ir and see and uh, then multiply by VR to get the power. So how do I compute the current going through here? What is IR? What is the current? If you use something like KCL. How do I compute the current? If I know the current, I can multiply by voltage to get power. So what contributes to this current flow? It's a current out of the inductor and out of one of the branches of your uh, capacitance. Right, so there's two components to this current, right? One is the current flowing from here. So one is Vs minus Vr over Z prime. And this is a current flowing over the impedance. And I have another current, which is a current going into the capacitor, right? Going into the capacitor. So since the current is going into the capacitor, this is minus Y prime times VR, right? This is the two parts of current we have. 
So now we just need to substitute some numbers into this. Okay? Now we just substitute some numbers. So Vs over Vr, Vs in a complex number form as Vs e to the j delta minus Vr. Vr is real number, so this is angle zero. Or Jx prime minus y prime over two. So we're going to substitute y prime to j omega c prime l over two times vr. Okay. We write out this way because once we multiply to get sr, we want to move real and the imaginary power. We want to separate out the real and imaginary part of sr. Okay. So we do this calculation. Then if you look at this, SR is VR IR star. Okay, so let's star this. So this is VR J delta minus VR J X minus over two VR star. Okay, I'm gonna star this. So what happens when you take the complex boundary gate? So this kind of equation, if I want to take complex boundary gate out of this whole thing, what do I get? So what happened to e to the j delta? I take conjugate, right? So there's many terms in this bracket when we, and the way I want to take this complex conjugate. What, what do I do here? E to the minus GS. Right, so this is E, so this is delta, sorry, it's not S. Let me write this bigger. Delta, so angle, we're using delta for angle, right? So basically, you just complex conjugate every term you see. Okay, so if you have a complex conjugate of a bunch of things, you just go individually and conjugate everything you see. Okay, so this is e to the minus j delta, this is e to the minus j delta. Vr doesn't change because Vr is a real number. This doesn't change. This turns to minus jx prime. Right, we're going to conjugate this term in the denominator plus j omega c prime l over 2 vr. Okay, so this is our complex conjugate. So we're going to multiply this, right? We're going to multiply vr into everything here. Okay. So here we get vr, vs e to the minus j delta minus vr squared minus jx prime plus j omega c prime l over two vr squared. Okay. So you multiply vr into this we, And then we're gonna use Euler's formula to write e to the minus j delta. Okay. We're gonna use Euler's formula to write e minus j delta into sine and cosine. And we're gonna move the minus j upstairs. And we do this, we get J, VR, VS, cosine delta, VR, VS, sine delta, minus G, J, VR squared, over X prime, plus J omega C prime over L over two VR squared. Okay, so we get this bunch of terms and we have some real parts, some imaginary parts. Okay. And this is just a calculation to get the power from one end of the transmission line to the other of the side of the transmission line. All right, so the next slide basically just repeats this. Okay. Next slide is the typed out version of the calculation I just did. So now let's collect the terms into two parts. Okay, so let's look at the real part. And the imaginary part. So let's put everything together and look at what they are. We are Vs cosine delta 
minus vr squared over x prime plus omega c prime l over two vr squared. Okay, so this is just collection of terms. Okay, so we have real part in the front and the imaginary part at the end. Okay. Any questions up to here for the derivation of the equations? Okay, all right. So if you look at those two parts, let's look at the real part. Okay, let's look at the real part. What is the maximum P I can send? Then if you look at this equation, what is the maximum power, real power I can send through this transmission line? It's not infinity, right? It's not infinity. So when I try to send power through this transmission line, normally I fix the voltage. So the voltage levels in the power system are normally pretty fixed. Okay, so we did all this per unit calculations. Basically, voltage does not vary very far from one per unit. Okay. So what we have control of is the angle. Okay, so normally what changes is the angle that changes in the power system. So if I change the angle, what is the maximum power I can send if I change delta? Ninety degree P is a one. Right, so I can make delta equals 90 degrees, right, or pi over two. And this we get is VR, VS over X prime. Okay. So this is what, for so this calculation basically tell us, if you fix the voltage level, you cannot send arbitrarily large power from one end to the other end. Okay. It's limited by the angle. And since this is a sinusoid, the angle wraps around. Okay. So the largest value you can get is given by this P max. Q max is something you know more complicated. You have to look at the second term. But anyway, so you can optimize over angle to get what Q max is. Okay. And this is the equation we have. And if you look at the plot, basically this is real power. This is the real power we have, and there's a peak. This denotes the maximum amount of real power you can send. Okay, this denotes the maximum amount of real power you can send. And uh, this is called the stability limit. Okay, this is called the steady state stability limit. So any ideas why this is called the stability limit? Why is this called the stability limit and not just, so why use the word stability? You know, think about why we're using the word stability and not just calling this a steady state limit. Okay. So let's think of, of dynamically what happens, dynamically what happens when we have this sort of, when we have this sort of curve. Okay. So remember this is our transmission line. So let's take a lossless transmission line. This is our pi model. And let's say this is some load. Okay, there's some load that pulling power out of this transmission line. And we're operating along this curve, right? This is our sine curve. So this delta, this is the real power P we're sending to the load. Okay, so this is receiving power PR sending to the load. And let's say we're operating at this point. Okay, let's say we're operating at this point. What happens when the load increases? Let's say now the load increases, what happened to this point? It uh, moves up the curve uh, towards the peak. Right, when the load increases, right, the generator or the, at the sending end, the angle will try to increase because it's trying to send more power. So the generator thinks, okay, I need the power to flow more. Then the angle increases this way. Okay, then the angle increase this way for load increase. Okay, we're operating at this point. Now, let's think about this. If I'm already operating at the maximum power I can transfer, okay, I'm operating at maximum power transfer, but then the load still increases, then what happens? Okay. 
right? So let's say I'm sending power at the maximum I can send it. But I'm sending this to a load. So let's say somebody attaches, you know, somebody flips the lights off, flip one, one more light onto the load. Or you attach, you know, something, some other load into this end, you try to charge one more computer. Then what happens to the generator? What happens to my system? You go past your st stability limit. Right, so you go past this point, and what happens when you pass this point is you still try to increase the angle. Okay, so you still try to increase the angle because you're thinking, okay, if the load increases, I need to increase the angle to give it more power. So you still try to run past this point. But this goes on forever because you run downhill, you're actually sending less power. So you're trying to draw more, you find an angle to increase the angle even more because you say the system still thinks you need more power from the generator. So this is actually unstable. If you operate, at, if at the peak, you try to get more power, then you have basically the generator runs away. Okay, they will have a runaway generator runaway. So, and this happens if you operate at this side of the curve. Basically, if you operate at this side of the curve, you have always have, this point becomes unstable. Because any small change, your angle just goes, you know, your angle just, be, uh, just increases basically without balance. Okay, your angle increases, but you never balance the load. So your generator basically starts spinning faster and faster. And uh, eventually, you know, either the generator trips its protection, or if it's badly designed, it will do damage to the generator, it will do damage to the machine. Okay, so this is the problem we have. That's why it's called stability limit. And basically, this tell you this is the operating region. Okay, so you try to operate to the left of the maximum. Okay, you try to operate to the left. So basically, you want to give yourself enough clearance to the maximum power transfer, so you don't uh, you don't get into an unstable situation, right? Then this sort of instabilities really causes a lot of problems. In the system. If you ever had this and the generator angle or some angle starts trying to try to run away on you, this is when bad things happen in your system, basically. Okay. So line stability limit is put is called stability limit, is because this when this kind of things happen, actually sometimes it's hard to tell. Because your line may be very much under its current limit. Okay. Your line may be, you know, the current may not be all that high. But still, you cannot transfer power that you cannot transfer any more real power. Okay? And uh, you want to stay under this limit. You want to always stay under this limit. All right. And so this is the most of the time, this is what stops us from sending power. Okay? This is most times stops us from sending power. Okay? All right. So any questions on this? Stability picture. So what if the uh, professor? Yeah. So when you calculate the uh, when you calculate the SR, you, but why you use like the only like the y prime over two times the vr, but not like the because of we have the two. Uh. Right. So I, I want this. I want this, right? I want this current. Okay. So this, the sending current just gets divided by y prime over two. Not, not consider the first of y prime over two. No, this doesn't matter, right? Because I know the voltage at this end. I know, I know this voltage is Vs. Okay. So since I know the nodal voltage, I know the current flowing through the impedance. I don't need the, the first y prime over two doesn't enter into the calculation, right? Right, so where we're computing the receiving power, we're computing the sending power, we have to compute. We have to add the first Y prime. But for the receiving power, we don't. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So is the operating region all the way up to the max power point or is it just shy no, of the max power that's point? That's shy of that. You never want to operate right next to it. Right. Uh, then, then anybody, you know, does, you know, you buy an electric vehicle, this will kick it over, right? So you actually is there like, you have, a, you have a safety factor. You're actually well below that. 
Yeah, so what is, what is normally that safety vector? Uh, we'll do that next. I'll cover that next. Okay. So yeah, so answer the question in the chat and we'll look at that safety vector. So question in the chat says, uh, if when the power system becomes unstable, how do you correct by, turn it, by turning the system off? So you never want to turn the system off as a power system, right? So the thing that makes power system difficult is sometimes like flying airplane, right? So, you know, if you're driving a car, if you're not sure what's going on, you can always pull over and stop, right? So for many systems, there's always, you know, the engineer jargon, there's a red, big red button and just press the red button and you shut everything off and you think about it. For airplanes and power systems, you cannot do that. Right, shutting off the power system is very, when it's running, is very bad. Okay, people are really unhappy if you lose power. Okay, if, if nobody told you you're gonna lose power, told you you will lose power and you suddenly lose power, people are very unhappy. And you never want to send shocks in a power system because it's all connected. If you turn some generators off, you're actually not sure what happens to the rest of the generators. This is very interconnect system. Basically, when you turn some generators off, what you send is you basically send a big impulse signal into the system. It's not easy to understand what the response of the rest of the system is. The power system often works by let's just simulate everything and make sure that we don't have to shut the system off. That's you know, the operating paradigm is overwhelmingly let's not try to stretch shot systems off. We're slowly moving towards so-called sort of more corrective uh, approaches, meaning that online, maybe I can do some adjustments to keep the system on. But most of the time, the thinking is let's just operate the system with enough margin and uh, think about all the bad things that can happen so we don't never have to shut it off. If at real time we ever have to shut things off, that's normally a very well sort of simulated response. So if you work for a system operator, you run exercise to say, okay, if I need to shut off 10% of the load, how do I do load shedding? How do I do load shedding? How do I do shut off? This kind of thing. And that's not easy. That's actually not quite simple. How do, how do we uh, dynamically adjust the system on the fly? And the solution is almost always, you know, never try to shut the system off. Okay, you can try to isolate part of the system. You can do load shedding in part of the system, but it's often uh, the last resort. The last resort is to shed power. And if you need to shed power, you normally tell people ahead of time. So we look at California now. California right now, Northern California, because of very high wind, they're doing plant outages. So they're basically saying we're not going to even try to supply load to some parts of the grid because we're forecasting high wind and we're not sure what, what, what will happen. But we energize a lot and we're trying to push current through a lot. So we're not just, we're just not going to use that line. This is more preferable than online when you have to do something. And how do you online, you know, how do you correct a power system online when it's operating? That's a big, big topic of research. In practice, the answer is almost always that uh, we're going to make sure well before we operate the system, we're not going to run into this kind of situation. And if we run into it, there's emergency procedures, but that normally is taking a little bit load off. So you have some sort of very frequency responsive load and you try to do load shedding that way. But you almost never sort of just shut the whole system off. That, that's sort of the worst thing that can happen. And even for when we have natural disaster, we don't try to shut the entire system off, okay? which I'll try to keep as much as operating as possible. So this goes into the other question as you know, so we never load it up to 90, right, to the entire PMAX. And that never, never aligns loaded to this, okay? We're not, and the, basically, if you try to do this, the software will throw an error, okay? Your software, error, your software will try to throw errors this way, you try to load it. Basically, what happens in practice, a number is, so a standard number limit is 35 degrees. It's an angle, 35 degrees, right? So we're just talking about the angle. 
uh, max angle difference. Between two ends. Okay, between two ends. Okay. So we have a line. Basically, you compute what is the power transfer for this angle to be 35 degrees difference. And your P max is actually uh, whatever that equation x prime sine. 35 degrees. Okay. So you never operate anywhere close. It never operate anywhere close to 90 degrees. Right? So this is the current limit we have. So you make sure you're even if something happens to your load, right? This is saying basically, even if my load doubles, I won't go to 90 degrees. Okay? You're limited very much below it. Okay? This to handle surges. Sometimes you have surges in the power system, so you want this angle to be very small. But if you look at this sort of restriction, what is the drawback of always requiring it to be under 35 degrees? So people are starting to complain about this, actually. So 35 degrees is uh, not you know, so this is standard we use for safety. But there's a big drawback if you just use 35 degrees. Right, so less efficient, right? You're artificially limiting me from sending power from one end to the other end, right? And this is, means uh, money. You look, basically, you're leaving money on the table. Okay, this is what happens, right? Because let's say, right, there's a demand surge somewhere. Let's say you, there's a demand that's you know surging in either Southern California or Texas, and they really want to buy power, and you're limited by 35 degrees, right? So you think you know if I can go to 45 degrees, I make a lot more money that way. I can send, by sending a little bit more power, I can make a lot more money. Okay? So it's always a trade-off between the efficiency between you know economic efficiency, meaning how much money do I make, versus reliability. And nowadays, since we're not building new transmission lines, but we're seeing you know, changes in load, there's talk about relaxing this limit. Okay? You want to relax this limit to squeeze more money out of the system. Okay? I want more money out of the system. Right? I'm gonna, and because wind and solar are normally not close to where the population centers are, and often you know, this will limit the money you can make, right? the profit you can make. So you often want to relax this a little bit, but relaxing this meaning we need to do a lot more calculations. We need to learn how to handle online situations. So in research, you know, you can think of some of the research going on today. They try to say, how do we operate, you know, ever closer to a stability limit? Okay, can we understand the stability limit better? Can we, oh, can we do some adjustment online to squeeze more efficiency out of the grid? And you know, if we could have you know build more lines in the grid, that would be less important. But we're not going to build more lines, at least in the U.S. So squeezing every little bit out of the lines we have becomes important. Okay. And so, and this is you know, how do we push this a little bit more? How do we understand uh, dynamic stability? How do we understand the sort of limits? Is important. That's sort of area of research that we have. And if you want to see more, this is. So this is Tom cover more in 455. So E455 will go into more depths of this kind of thing. Okay, so that's a, I think that's a part one of a capstone class. As you actually get a big system power system and run some simulation studies. Now, what if I make this 45 degrees? Does bad things happen? Right? Or how much money am I losing? You know, between I say 35. Versus if I'm really aggressive, I want to push this to 60 degrees. Right? These are the questions you can ask. We operate the system. And the money is normally not small. Okay? And the amount of uh, money going from, say, 35 to 60 is not a small number. Okay? So there's a lot of thinking about what to do with this angle. And in addition to this uh, real power limit, 
we often also have voltage limits. Okay. So next we'll look at voltage limits. Okay. Next we'll look at voltage limits. Basically, what we want is we want VR over VS not to be too small, right? Not to be or too not too far from one per unit, but not too far from one actually. We look at this ratio. Okay, so we want the angle not to be too big for stability reasons. Voltage turns out we have the sim a similar impact as we want this not to be very far from one. We want the voltage at two ends not to be too far apart from each other. Okay, so any more questions about the line stability limit, about the line loadability on the active power part? Okay, so this is uh, this equation is an important equation to remember and know how to find. Okay, well, you will be, uh, you'll see this equation all over the place when you do power system engineering. It's quite commonly used, this equation, yes. So this is just a picture of all the interconnections between two areas. You can look at different voltages and uh, basically a lot of the transfer from Quebec to the northeastern US is again limited by the stability limits. And this actually becomes complicated when you have this many lines. So later in the class, we'll come back and we'll look at what happens when we have multiple lines and not just one line. When we have many, many lines, they all have limits. How do we operate a system like this? But before that, we'll finish the story by looking at the reactive power balance, okay, by looking at reactive power balance. Basically, reactive power means this, right? Reactive power means this. There are three elements in this circuit. So let's think of this circuit, the pi model. This is supplying reactive power. Power. If you have Q, that's the supplying Q. This is uh, consuming. is consuming key. And often this reactive power, what the reactive power does, it messes with your voltage in the system. It messes with your voltage. So voltage tends to increase if you supply a lot of reactive power, and voltage tends to decrease when you draw a lot of reactive power. And this is what happens when we have the reactive power in the system. And one way to understand Let's look at this reactive power. So remember, if you look at the pi model calculation, right, for the pi model we have, if you look at this react power sends out, like this receive reactive power, what we have is VRVS cosine delta minus VR squared over X prime plus omega CL over two VR square. Okay. So if you look at this equation and you look at the reactive power, basically reactive power depends very strongly on the square term of voltage. Okay. And so when you send when you change reactive power, basically turns by the numbers, it turns out uh, reactive power impacts voltage quite a bit. Well, our power really doesn't impact the angle all that much. Because if you look at angle dependence, angle dependence only comes into cosine, cosine delta. And for delta small, cosine delta is roughly one. Okay? So delta is not very sensitive to your reactive power, but voltage is. Okay? Voltage is quite sensitive to reactive power. So that's why we when you talk about voltage stability, often we talk about reactive power. All right, so, and the, what can happen for reactive power balance is falling. So let's look at what happens when the load is light. Okay, lightly loaded means you're not drawing much power out of the receiving end. So the current magnitude is small and the voltage 
and the per unit voltage is quite close to one per unit. And in this situation, what the voltage tends to do is the voltage is high because Qx is small and Qc is relatively large in this situation. So my voltage in the system is generally very high on the receiving end. So this flows of voltage. Okay. Then conversely, if you look at a heavy low situation, heavy low situation, the current is large, and then the voltage becomes lower. Okay. Then the voltage becomes lower because you have a large current. So there is a roughly fairly large QX, and this takes out a lot of reactive power out of the system. And this, then the, what that causes is it causes a low voltage situation. You can think of there's a large current flowing through this impedance elements, and that causes a relatively large voltage drop across this impedance. And because this voltage drops across this impedance, this capacitor is not supplying as much reactive power as before. So in total, you have less reactive power, and the voltage will tend to drop along this. Okay, this voltage will tend to drop. So the idea is basically we need to compensate. Okay, and we will compensate for voltage using a bunch of uh, equipment. Basically, we will add some equipment to compensate for voltage. And turns out voltage is easier to compensate because it depends on reactive power. To supply reactive power, you don't need to do any work. You don't need a you don't need to convert energy from one form to another form. All you need to do is to add some capacitors and some inductors, then you can compensate for reactive power. All right. And the way to compensate comes down to two things, two forms. One is you can add things in shunt. One is you can add things in series. Okay, so there are two things you can do. You can either in parallel try to boost or reduce the voltage, or you can in series try to change the basically the inductance of the line and try to correct for voltage changes. Okay. Now all of this is quite uh, intuitive. Actually, the way we change voltage is quite intuitive, right? What it says is, if you think the voltage is too high, you add a shunt inductor. Okay. You add discrete inductors to this. So this means I have some transmission line. And this is the end of the line. And you're just putting some inductor, switching inductor here. And this will help you to change the apparent capacity, capacitance of the line. Right. You put, you're adding inductors in parallel, so they will cancel out some of the, if you think your capacitance is too high, they will cancel out high capacitance. So this is quite simple. Right. And if you think your capacitance is not high enough, you're putting additional shunt capacitors. Okay. So in parallel, what we can do is you have some line, then you put in some discrete, Capacitance, switching capacitance, and you're putting some discrete switching inductance to this line. And depending on the actual situation, depending on actual load, you can switch this element in and out. You can switch these. Any questions about this compensation? This is called shunt compensation. And this, you know, exactly as how you think you would do it. Basically, you just add elements in parallel to the line. Okay, this is how you do a shunt. So this is easy to install. This is easy to control because all you have to measure is you measure the low side current. From that, you can program when you switch. Okay, you can program when you switch. Okay, so this is in shunt. And we can do this in series compensation. For example, you still have a line. You add a comp switching capacitor in series. Okay. You add this. So by opening and closing this switch, you can change the impedance of the line. You can change the impedance of the line. So any questions about this? So 
So uh, would you prefer to do a composition in series or in, uh, in shot? Is there a reason to prefer one over the other? So let's say I do this compensation, series compensation. What is the step benefit? In addition to changing voltage, right? So I can change the reactive, the reactance of the line. So this changes the voltage. What other benefit do I get out of this? If I put it the steady state stability limit as well. Right, I can increase the steady state increase stability limit, right? Because then the active power transfer, this is X prime, basically you're subtracting this XC out of it, right? You're putting a capacitor in a series with a inductor. So we're just subtracting this out. So this has a side benefit of increasing my loadability, increasing my stability limit. Okay? This has this, this added benefit. So often if you can do this, you tend to, you know, you have some serious compensation that gives you both active and reactive power control. It gives you both of it. But the challenge, the challenge with this serious compensation, as your protection becomes very, very complicated. Okay, your protection becomes complicated. Because anytime you open and close a switch, it looks like you're shorting the line somewhere. Whenever you open and close the switch, the line, it seems like you're, you know, you have a fault on the line because the line impedance is changing. Then there's how to do this protection on the line, how to do this sort of switching protection on the line becomes a lot more complicated. The control laws are not always easy to program. And if you try to switch this line in and out, this introduces a lot of harmonics on the line. And a lot of times your equipment don't really like harmonics on the line. But then if you take the, so if you take the power electronics classes or you work on power electronics, there's, again, this is the area of uh, research you are looking at, or people are still making devices that says my serious compensation, my compensator, one is can work with the protection scheme, two, it can damp out this kind of harmonics. I can switching away that reduces harmonics on the line. So this is what still uh, people are doing research when you have serious compensation. Right. And uh, so, for example, these are the devices you cover more in power electronics. And, you know, how do you make this kind of switching capacitors? How do you use the thyristor control? How do you do mechanical control? How do you add filtering components? We won't worry very much about how exactly you build compensators. But you take something like <clears throat> power electronics, you'll go a lot more in depth. How do, you, how do you exactly build this kind of things? How do you do this mechanical switching? If you switch, right, and you put harmonics onto the line, how do you damp out this harmonics? Okay, there's a lot of work in this area when you do uh, compensation. Okay. So even though, when well, in this class, we'll, draw, we'll just draw like this, which is, oh, a capacitor, you know, with a switch. Actually, it's not this simple. And uh, you can make some money by designing a good compensator. Right? You can, you know, it's a, a good area. There's new ideas compensator that comes a lot, that comes in more and more along this way. And all of this is, you can think of where this is driven again, by the fact that we can do nothing to the lot. Okay, so often, if you look at this, this is your transmission line. Okay, so this is the transmission line. This pi model come from the transmission line. We're not going to do very much to this transmission line. What we can do is we can do things on the two ends of the line. We can do things on the edge of the lines. So there's a lot of interesting ideas. I think given this is my piece of transmission line, how do I do things on the edge? Okay, to make the lines, you know, either increase the loadability limit or to boost the voltage or to try to make the stability better. So that's why a lot of innovations have been to the end. And you see sort of fancy power electronics devices comes out. And they're actually big part of the system. So you look at the system, if you look at substation, all of this is a static bar compensator. 
Okay, you may ask, what are these? These are the switches, the sirens, the, the capacitors, the, the static inductors, the static capacitors, the switches, the TCRs, that's all this, okay? So whenever you go to a substation and take a look, what they're doing, they're trying to really compensate for the transmission line. So the transmission line, it is what it is. Sometimes good for the system, sometimes not so good. We'll do as much as we can at the two ends of the line. And uh, the big equipment, the big expensive equipment's all going here. All going here. You see switching, you see compensation. So it's quite a sort of active field to figure out what, you know, can you design this better, for example? Okay. Can you design this more efficiently? Can you do this with less losses? All of this is a still active field. You have companies making devices. But for us to remember this, you know, from this first part of the lecture is one, their stability limit okay, of the line, which is very important. And it's not really related to the thermal, uh, the thermal capacity of the line. And second is we may have to change reactive power to do voltage. We may have to uh, change reactances and capacitance to do uh, voltage compensation. Level. Any questions before we break? Okay, so if not, let's break for 10 minutes. So let's come back at 1038, and we'll start to look at generator models. We'll do a review on generator models. So I'll be back in uh, three minutes.
Um, professor? Yep. I have a question about the example on the slide 12 on... Um, sure. Line. Slide 12? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, so literally that um, I try to find um, gamma equal uh, square root of um, z times y. Mm -hmm. So I plug in the number and I calculate the gamma and then I find uh, the sin h of gamma times l and I always get the error. Like you always it, get an error? Yes. Uh, like I couldn't get any number from that. So is that for the gamma, we just put in the um, whatever we have for Z and Y. We yeah, you put, you put in whatever you have for Z and Y. Yeah. But, but sign H should never give you an error, right? It, yeah. It's defined for every number. It's defined for all complex numbers. Is okay. your calculator in radians or degrees? Because it only works in radians. Really? Oh, maybe it, it's in degree, yes. No, no, oh. no, sign H is hyperbolic sign. It has nothing to do with radian or degrees. Oh, really? But, the, but the, the computer, the calculator won't process it if it's set to degrees because it's expect, because it does, it, it can't process the irrational number or something like that. It throws oh. back an error if your calculator is in degree. Oh, okay. Yes, I, my calculator in, is, is in degree. Okay. Okay, I, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay, yeah, so you want, to, so let's be sure what sign H is, right, so. Yeah, so I have a TI-84, uh, and then I just, I have that function in there, I just put in, but it's always getting error, so I couldn't finish the homework because of that. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, then check, yeah, then check uh, what it means for your calculator, but. Yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, sign H is, e to the x minus e to the minus x over t, right? This is what sin h is. So there's not a notion of radians or degrees. There's not a sinusoid, right? So there's no degree, pi, whatever. This just, we write sin h because it's a shorthand for e x minus e to the minus x over t. So this is well defined for any number that you have. I guess well, if your computer needs to compute e to, e to the x, it may need to use the orders formula. So there may be a degrees or radian thing, but yes, then put it always in radians. I guess that's what, yeah. Always in radians. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so any other questions about this? So if now we'll go to uh, generator models, right? we'll go to generator models. And uh, generator models is really not part of the book. It's a review for us, but everything is self-contained in the slides. So it's all self-contained in the slides. And the generator model, so if you take in 351, this will be very similar to what we did in 351. So remember that for our system, right? Basically we have, so we have look at the transformers. We have look at the lines. And then now we look at generators and now we'll finish. We'll get an equivalent, we'll review what the equivalent model for generators is. A generator, if you don't remember, is a way to convert a primary form of energy, often mechanical energy or chemical energy, uh, into electric energy, right? So what it does is you have some primary form of energy into it. For example, you can, uh, this is steam, right? You can shove steam into a prime mover. This will turn a generator and outflow electrical energy. Right? So this is, how many of the generations technologies work. There is one special exception to this idea of looking, going from primary form to mechanical form to electrical form. Can I think of a generation technology that doesn't follow this flow? 
There's one exception to this uh, for most of the things we use. Solar, right? So this is except solar. Okay, so solar is solar skips this internal step. Solar just says I have some radiation. I'm not going to convert produce electricity directly. Right? Skips this internal steps. So solar is really not a synchronous generation. In the sense, there's nothing 60 hertz about solar, right? So it's just a DC current or DC voltage that comes. It's a basically, a, it's a DC current source. We look at solar, okay? So what we're saying applies to mostly other form of generators. Solar is one exception. When you put solar into a system, it's actually tricky how you model solar inside the system. So for now, that's when we say generators, think of we have this sort of synchronous 60 hertz thing going on in the generator. Basically, something is turning at 60 hertz. Okay. This, for wind, wind actually follows this dynamics because wind is mechanical energy. So it's turning a generator turbine. Okay, so wind follows this. Solar does not. So solar is the special form of energy. But uh, so for now, let's think of a generator with some things. It's, we're just thinking of synchronous generator meaning something is turning at a synchronous rate. So how does the generator work? Well, basically you turn a big magnet inside the generator. So that's how you do is you turn this, uh, you have a rotating magnet, you turn this rotor, and uh, because, because you're turning this magnet, you're creating a changing field and this field rotates with the rotor. And basically from the stator's perspective is the changing field. And we'll generate some sinusoidal current. All right, so if you look at the synchronous generator, basically this is some, this is a magnet. So if you look at the induced voltage of this generator, right? Basically what happens as you wind, so this is a, so these are windings of a wire. And this windings carries a sinusoidal voltage in the generator because we're turning the magnet, right? We're turning the magnet this way and you have loops of wires on the stator itself. We'll see a changing field and this is change, sees a changing voltage form. And now the interesting question is, if you look at this word generator, so most of our generators are salient pole generators. There's an air gap and uh, basically you develop the field in the air gap and so on. And uh, this will generate electricity. Now the question is, this gets some sinusoidal waveform. Right? There's some, some sinusoidal waveform. If I want this to be 60 hertz, okay, let's say I want this to be 60 hertz, that's our system frequency. How fast do I have to turn the generator? Okay, so we're often interested in the generator speed as something in terms of RPM. Right, so rotations or revolutions per minute. So this is rotation per minute. So if I want a 60 Hertz sinusoid, how many times do I have to turn this generator? This is fairly straightforward. Right, so for one turn, right? So basically one turn of the generator creates this one period in the sinusoid. So it's not one RPM, right? So, so the chest has 60 times per second or one RPM. So 60 times per second is correct, right? So six times per second revolution. Yeah, this is 60 Hertz. So each second I need to turn this thing 60 times. So then the speed of the generator 
normally written as n, n for the speed of the generator. This is 60 times 60, right? Because we're talking about per minute, so 60 seconds per minute. This is 360 RPM, okay? 360 RPM. So you turn this generator at 360 RPM to generate it at 60 hertz, okay? It's generated 60 hertz. And actually this, this actually says, if you take a generator from the US to Europe, it, will, it wouldn't work actually. Because they have a 50 hertz frequency group. Okay, so our generators are turning at, are designed to turn very efficiently at 60 or some multiple of 60 hertz. But if you change the grid frequency, it's actually 50 hertz. Okay, so the generators cannot work across different frequencies. Right? So you, when you have design a generator, this is basically a hard-coded value sometimes into the generator. All right, so this slide repeats the calculation. Basically, we want angular frequency of 2 pi f, and that turns out into a time domain frequency of 360 RPF, revolutions per minute. But turning 60 hertz is sometimes is fast, right? So 360 RPF is fast, especially if you have a big generator. Right? This generator are big machines. You're turning this thing at, three, at the 3600 RPF. Right? This may be too fast mechanically for how fast I can turn this rotor. Okay. So, for, so what if I want to turn this at a slower speed? Right? Often, for example, we have a large hydro station it's very hard to get enough water flow to turn this at 3,600 RPM. Okay, when you have hydro, it's just very hard to mechanically get to turn this fast. Right, so what if my mechanically my generator cannot turn this fast? Is there a way to reduce the speed rotation but still maintain 60 hertz? Gearing? Not gearing, no. Gearing can change speed, but often gearing is a messy solution that uh, only used for wind. Because wind is something there's nothing you can do about the speed of wind, so use gearing. Rest of the time, what we do is we use poles. Basically add a number of poles. <laughs> we add a number of poles as uh, basically, you're saying, okay, for each revolution, I create one period of the sine wave. So now, since I cannot turn that quickly, I want to say for two revolutions, for one revolution, I want two periods. Uh, this is basically what Paul does, right? You just add more poles to the generator. For more poles, you increase the apparent number of turns you have. Okay? So for used to be for one revolution, I got one period. Now for one revolution, I got two periods because you have multiple poles. You have seen this rotation toward in the generator. So this is, right, so before we have, this is a two pole machine. Now we have a four pole machine. The more poles you have, the slower the generator can turn, to still maintain 60 hertz of a sinusoid. Okay? So not all generator has to turn very fast. Okay? So for the pole calculation, what we have is, so number of poles basically steps up, you can think of, from the actual mechanical revolution speed we have to the apparent speed we see to the electric, to the electrical frequency. So the equation is the number of revolutions per minute we need as 60 divided by P times F. And P here is pole pair. So for pole, for poles, this is P equals to two. So a two pole machine is P equals to one, four pole machine equals P equals to two. So if your frequency is 60 Hertz, number of poles, number of pole pairs is two, then the, row, then the turn speed we need from the actual generator uh, 1800 RPM. So this is, how do you get the generator to turn slower? 
right? So generator turns to be turns uh, to be slower. Okay. So different types of generators we make it differently. We make it differently. So for something like large steam or gas, normally we can drive the steam such a way that mechanically we can turn the generator turbines pretty fast. So these are engineered to be you know, one or two pole machines. Then for hydro and wind, you have a lot more pole pairs. Okay, just not very efficient to design a machine that needs to turn very fast. So you turn much slower. And then use there are many poles, right? use many pole pairs to create a 60 for the sanyo soil. All right, so this is a bit of review of a generator setup. Right, so different generators because you know different number of poles. And that's why our so this kind of generator design is actually why we're very tied to a 60 hertz grid. Okay, well that's this sort of, so if you look at our grid, right? So we have 60 hertz grid. What exactly happens when we hit 59 hertz? Anybody know what happens? I say you magically change the frequency in the grid curve we currently have to 59 hertz. Why is it so bad? So this goes from 60 to 59 hertz, every alarm in the operating center will go off. Like you set off every alarm we have. But why is this so bad if we change the frequency? By you know, one hertz. Well, because should it go back and affect the generator then this time? Right, because the generators are designed to operate so to operate at 60 hertz as a such targeted way. And because this generator are very big machines, they don't like deviating from their sort of preferred speed of right, preferred speed. So if you change this to 59 hertz, that forces the generators to operate at 59 hertz, for example. Right? Generator cannot find a grid. So generator has to slow down 59 hertz. And for these big machines, they really don't like it. And the generators are designed to just operate at a very narrow band. So because this is the way that we design the generators, so the frequency basically, one is a good target, two is a limitation of how much we can move the frequency, okay? how much we can move the frequency. And this is because we have huge machines that can only operate at exactly or close to their design speeds. So if you go to you know a big uh, steam turbine and say I'll operate at 58 hertz, I generate something at 58 hertz, it won't work. It will shut down for safety reasons. It's not designed to operate at that frequency. Okay? And generator design by itself is extremely complicated. So if you want to, you know, anybody interested in mechanical engineering, I want to look at the mechanical model of a generator. It's a seventh order partial differential equation. Uh, just that is sort of all that moving parts and uh, you can solve that differential equation, but it's not an easy thing to solve. Okay? So from an operational point of view, from a system design point of view, our goal is just offer the system you know, as close to 60 hertz as possible. Just don't deviate very far away from it. Okay? It turns out the European system is the European generators or other generators, generators in other systems are not this tied to the operating frequency. So in Europe, you can generally let it float a little bit more. And now if you look at things, a microgrid or a distribution system that doesn't really have a big generator, then the frequency actually is much less important. So if you go to a you know, distribution system or a microgrid that's fairly standalone, then the frequency can go from you know, 40 to 70, you can go all over the place. And for some designs, they don't even care about the frequency. If a lot of DC microgrids, they don't care about frequency. But from big systems, because those generators were limited to operate at very close to 60. Any questions about generators, rotation speed, frequency? So when the generator like drops down to 59 right. hertz, does it change the whole um, circuitry down to 59 hertz as well? 
Uh, no, if a generator needs to go to 59 hertz, it basically shuts off, it will disconnect from the system. Because the generator was just controlled by there's a feedback loop to how fast you turn the shaft, right? So there's probably a mover, you have to turn that. That really fights against something that's not designed as its natural frequency, basically. So it's very hard to change that frequency by, you know, even one by one hertz, or equivalent to one hertz. So what generator does is this can go a little bit slower, a little bit faster, but for a lot of frequency change, what happens? You have this torsion thing in the prime mover that just twists it like this. Mm -hmm. Because the grid is trying to be slow, your mechanical feedback loop hasn't done that yet. You have something that's twisting you at 60, this twisting at 50, you have this kind of rotation. So that's bad for the prime movers and bad for the generators. So you get like actual mechanical failure. Yeah, you get actual mechanical things, you get things, you know, to avoid this, big thing breaking on you, right? You basically just shut down, you just disconnect the generator and power okay. it down. Yeah. So it's quite, yeah, quite sensitive to this. Okay, so this, so everything we said carries over to three phase generators. And all you do is to have three uh, windings. Right? So three, three phase two single phase generator, nothing changes except you have more windings. So instead of one pair, you look at, you put three windings, so you have A, B, C phase. Right? So that's really nothing much changes out of that. So let's look at the generator model we have. So electrically, when we look at the generator, basically we will see we, ha we have some voltage, the generator internally. This is the ideal voltage source from the generator. We'll go through asynchronous reactants. Again, because remember, we have windings, we have coils of wires. So somewhere we have an inductor in the system. We'll go through a synchronous react, sorry, go through a state of resistance, okay, because again, the wires are not perfect. And we have the terminal of the generator. So the most important thing for the generator is actually getting all of this terminology is correct. And you get all the terminology correct. So this is XS, RS. This is some current I. This, uh, this voltage is V, okay? And the two voltages are not the same. So the two voltages are not the same. So what happens, the name for these two voltages is, this E is called the internal EMF. Because this in some sense is internal to the generator, we don't really have access to this. But as a generator, you can think of the generator setting up a voltage. And this is called the, this point is called the terminal of the generator. This is a terminal generator because this is two points you have access to. So it's called the generator terminal. And then this voltage is called the stator voltage or the terminal voltage. We we'll call the stator or the terminal voltage. So just the names for this. Uh, with these generators, right? So this is our electric model for the generator. It's a ideal water source sitting behind a series impedance. That's the generator and uh, so all the names are given here. Terminal voltage, any question about this? So this is something we should have all seen, right? I'm assuming this is at least somewhat familiar to most of us, because this is 351, parts of 351. All right, so most of the time, we'll just ignore RS, because RS is very small, and uh, RS really doesn't change any numbers we compute for this generator. So we'll just ignore RS, and I think the wire is uh, mostly ideal. And then the rest is basically, what happens with the generator is what controls the power output of the generator 
at the internal field, the terminal voltage, and the angle between these two voltages. Okay, so those both are you can think of a complex voltages. So their magnitude and their angle difference controls the power flow through this generator. So the EMF, internal electromagnetic force, as the, basically, as the, if I change this current, the magnetizing current, I can change E. So I have some control of the voltage of the generator by changing the current I pass through this magnetic, right? So I have a magnet, so by changing the current I pass through this, I can change the internal, voltage and to some extent I have a linear scaling to this voltage so to control the amount of power I pass through this generator I can boost this internal voltage and uh, before saturation if I increase the amount of magnetizing current I pass through this I, I can change the voltage after some point you know stop being very sensitive to this current So anybody remember what the field current does? So this IF, this is the field current. Anybody remember what this thing does? Why do I need the DC current here? Okay, so what this field current does is basically this controls the voltage you see. Okay, this is a DC current. You drop wires around the magnet. You run a DC current across it. This is a determines the internal EMF. Okay, determines this voltage value E. You operationally can think of this way. And this current does not provide any power. Okay, all it does is changes E. And by changing E, it sort of determines how much of the mechanical energy you extract by turning this. This is what IMF does. And this current is normally controllable. So you have a feedback, this you have a feedback controller that can sort of change the internal EMF E, this E value up and down a little bit. Okay. So this is this way we have with the current. So again, to emphasize where the power comes from. The power comes from the prime mover, right? From a mechanical prime mover. And this mechanical prime mover generates electric energy. And the internal EMF is sort of the, inter the voltage representation of how much potential this, can, can, this thing can crank out of it. Okay. And the, the controls we have is basically, we have two controls we can do to our generator. One is a mechanical control, right? So let's say I want to push more or less power out of this generator. What you normally do is you can open and close a valve. If there's a steam generator, you open and close a valve, a steam comes in, to change how much power you put into the generator. So this is the control of mechanical power. Thus you need to, this is a feedback loop that controls the valve. This is called a governor control. What we can also do is we can have exciter control. Exciter controls the voltage on the generator. And this is the electric control. Right? This is sort of this electric control. So we so two controls we have is the mechanical control basically balance out the power we have in the generator, and the electric control try to track the voltage at the terminal. So if the terminal voltage changes, this electric control will try to keeps the magnitude of the internal EMF roughly tracking the terminal voltage. And then the, act, the active power control will uh, go through the governor control. All right, so both are automatic. Both are quite automatic. They have feedback loops. You have, uh, if you ever taking a course on control theory, this is where your feedback controllers come in. You basically have a PID controller sitting inside the feedback loop. Trying to maintain this, right? I'm trying to maintain this. So, 
If you think about these two control loops, okay, think about these two control loops, the exciter is normally much faster than the governor because one is electronic, one is mechanical. So the electronic control is normally much faster than the mechanical control. Okay. All right, and uh, basically what this control does is say, elect so in a circuit diagram sense, right, electrically, what we can think of is we're gonna assume the controls all take care of the internal generator dynamics. Okay, and for us, from a system analysis point of view, we're looking at a very good, uh, we're looking at a very clean model, basically. There are some things, internal EMF, that has an angle, delta. There it creates a current, and this current goes out to a terminal. And this is always a reference. We always take the terminal to be the reference. All right, this is always terminal of the reference. And basically the rest of the class is to get some equations that relates E, V, theta, and delta to each other. Okay. This is what we want to do. We want to know how much power I can deliver at the terminal. Okay. So we always want to know that. So for example, if you connect to a load, Want to look at what happens at the load, and we're going to always assume normal operations. We assume the frequency is 60 hertz. Assume the voltage is maintained to be constant. Okay. We're going to assume that the feedback loops does all these nice things for us. So let's see if the generator is in an open circuit. If the generator is an open circuit, what we have is there's no current flow, obviously. There's, we have no current flow. The two voltages uh, have the same, are the, exactly the same, because there's no current drops through the synchronous reactants. And both P and Q are equal to zero. Okay. And both P and Q equal to zero. Right? There's no, so this is the base case. Now let's look at it, what happens to the resistive load. Okay, let's say I add a resistor to the terminal. Let's look at what, what are the current and the voltages. So I in this case is V over R. Okay, this is V over R. Then what is the angle of this current when we're referencing to the terminal? What is angle? Zero degrees, right? Angle zero degrees. Because remember, we're always referencing everything to the terminal. If you're referencing to the terminal and there's a resistive load in the terminal, then the current and the voltage are in phase. Okay? And the terminal voltage are in phase. So if you look at the internal EMF, the E, this is V plus Jxs times I. This is V plus Jxs V over R. Okay. So this is the E internal EMF. So basically, if you want to draw the phasor diagram, this is V, this is Jxx. I, this is delta, so delta is larger than zero. So you're leading, or somewhat leading, the voltage. So the internal EMF leads the stator voltage, leads the terminal voltage. And P here is V I cosine theta. This is just I. V squared over R, Q is V I sine theta. This is just zero, this is just zero. So we can look at this resistive load. 
uh, you match basically you match mechanical power to the load, and then not much it's not very difficult to supply this load. So next, let's look at what happened to a RL load. So for RL load, all this is similar calculation. You figure out the current through this equation, then you figure out the internal EMF by looking at the current drop across the impedance axis, across the impedance axis. Okay, and uh, a similar uh, across a RC load, so a similar calculation. You first compute I as V over R minus J omega C so this is sorry not J omega C one over omega C this is this gets you I then E as V plus J XS times I. So whatever the law we have, if you know the impedance, we can find the current, then we can find the volt the internal EMF voltage. Okay. So not very hard. So now if you look at the generators, okay, so generator both supplies reactive and active power. This is true. So the interesting thing is, if you want to connect generators together, do we connect them in parallel or do we connect them in series? Let's say I have two generators or many generators, I want to connect them together. Why in parallel? Okay, so chess has parallel, but why? Same voltage, right? So when you connect generators, it is almost always connect through in parallel. Okay, don't change your generators together. Do not change generators together. Okay, right. okay we'll connect them in parallel. This is the same reason when you have two voltage source, right? You connect them in parallel. Okay, you want to connect them. Right, so you basically the internal EMF is pretty easy to operate. It's pretty easy to operate the internal EMF to set up such that the voltage are roughly equal to each other. And whenever you look at the generators, most like most times they're connecting this form. Okay, they're connecting in parallel, not in series. And from a system point of view, it's often the case that you need the view, they look like a parallel connection because you have some line connect to a low, some other line connect to a low. You have a generator, the ground, you have a generator, think of two ground. So all of this looks like a parallel connection to us. Synchronous generators connecting parallel. And the assumption we make as each generator is fairly small when you look at the generator to the rest of the system. Okay, so when we look at the generator to the rest of the system, we're gonna always make, make an assumption that we have a generator and we connect it to the rest of the system. So this is the grid. Whatever we do as a generator is not gonna impact the grid very much. Okay, so the assumption is always that the, our generator are quite small. We, com, we connect to the entire, compared to the entire grid. So when we look at the system model to the, to the grid, as we often think of the grid as a perfect, uh, as, a, as, a, as a perfect uh, bus, as can always hold us as basic as an infinite bus, which means that the grid can always hold its voltage steady. Okay, so we look at the grid model, we always assume that the system, this basically is a constant voltage. Voltage. 
This is constant voltage. And our generator is quite small when we connect to the constant voltage group. Okay. We'll look at, this is the assumption we'll make. And when we talk, think about synchronous generator, really we're not supplying power to any particular load inside, inside the grid. Okay. We're just injecting power into the entire system and the power will sort itself out once it goes into the grid. Okay. The power sorts itself out once it flows into the rest of the system. Okay. So that's why if somebody starts, you know, you can buy power directly from renewables or you want to buy power specifically from a particular generator, that's actually not possible. Okay, that's not how this generator works. Okay, basically the generator works by, I'm sending some power into the entire system and it's up to the system to redistribute the power somehow. So if you as a load, it's almost impossible for you as a load to buy power directly from a particular generator. Okay, either, you know, if you really want to buy power from wind or solar, uh, it's actually hard for you to say how much of your power is generated from wind or solar. That's really not accounting that we can do easily. Or you see, you know, you'll see sort of weird, uh, some, sometimes you have weird uh, rules that can say, you know, a maximum, let's say you're a city, I say all, all the city has to be supplied by renewable power, or you have rules that says the city cannot be supplied by any renewable power. We do see this kind of rules in some parts of the country. Both of these rules are not really physically relevant. Okay, it's not something you can do. Okay, so all generators inject power into a system, all loads draw power from the system. The exact percentage of how much your load is generated by a particular generator, that's, some, that's something we need to do calculations with. And that's determined basically by Kirchhoff's laws and Ohm's laws. Not something we can stipulate how much you know, this generator goes to that load. Okay, that's not really something we can do. Okay? That's decided by just how current flows. All right. So I think we have a little bit to do with generators today. Uh, we'll do that next time. So next time we'll finish up with the jet. We'll do the more uh, detailed equation for generators. Wouldn't take us that long. So somebody made a claim the panel is presenting a new arena model in Seattle. Prove it to show the <laughs> to their consumption. Yeah. So it's hard to say. So. Right, so you see a statement like this sometimes, right? So sometimes a company will say, you know, we're 100% renewable or we get our power 100% from renewable sources. If they, if they sit in a grid, they really, that's hard to say physically. So what typically do you do is you say, okay, how much power do I need? I will pay to create a wind, as, wind or solar or some renewable generator that generates the power, right? So if, I, if my load is 100, is 100 megawatt, and I want to say I'm, I'm 100% you know, renewable, what you do is, let's say you pay a wind farm to pay to build a wind farm sometime, somewhere in the system. That's 100 megawatt. And you say, okay, I have offset my load with a new generation. How much of that new wind farm power actually gets to you, it's hard to say. And for sure, not 100% will get to you. But if you hear claims like, you know, I'm 100% renewable, or our target is, you know, Amazon has a target of I'm 100% carbon neutral by 2050, I'm 100% renewable. This means, you know, I'll, right now at least, is I'll pay enough to build some renewable generation that's offside my load. But in fact, this is all distributed equally, not equally, but spread out in the system. Okay. And in this class, we'll actually look at how exactly it's spread out. Okay. We'll look at how exact, how do we compute how much from this generator, what percentage of this is getting to this low. This is some calculation we can do. Okay. With, you know, in a few lectures, we'll be able to do that sort of calculation. But you can never make sure you know, it's a one-to-one -one connection. That's just not something you can do physically. All right, so we'll end the lecture here today. Next time we'll do a few more equations with synchronous generators. Then we'll go to large scale power systems after that.
So any questions about this lecture or the homework? If not, I'll see you on Wednesday. I have a quick question from yeah, part one of the class. Okay. For the previous slides. Yeah. When we were deriving the equations and we had, a, I believe it was like slide to our, slightly this? before this yeah okay. so this well actually yeah on this slide if you could go back please yeah, yeah. the c that's a c prime right that's a c prime yes okay so the j j omega c prime is that essentially the that's the y prime divided by the length yeah that's a y prime divided by the length i should have wrote it yeah yeah that's a y prime divided by the length okay okay yeah. So that already incorporates the coefficient f. Yeah, yeah, factors all the all the correction factors. In there, yes. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Any more questions? Maybe one more question for the last, for number six on the homework. Mm -hmm. We would want to convert everything to a single uh, per phase circuit, meaning we want to get everything line to neutral because the values given are line to line. Uh, wait a minute, let me take a look at the homework. Okay. Yeah. So six. Uh, yeah, either way is fine. Either way is fine. So if you calculate the voltage, just be clear whether you're computing the line to neutral voltage or line to line voltage. Okay, okay. Yeah. But in the end, we're, we're trying to get line to line voltage at the sending end, correct? Yeah, so ideally, we sh you should report the line to line voltage. But so if you don't say what voltage you're reporting, you, you're calculating the assumption is the line-to-line -line voltage. But as long as you're clear, this is the line-to-neutral voltage, that's also fine for this homework question. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, hi, Professor. Yeah. I have a question for the problem six. Mm -hmm. So yes. is this a load right? By this one divided by three to get the loading for each phase. Sorry, can I repeat the question? Yes, the load of the receiving ending absorbs nine megawatts plus mm -hmm. J times plus a megawatt. Mm -hmm. And then should you divide this number by three for like the each phase line? Yes, so this is a total power. This is a three phase total three phase power. And also for that convert to thirty three kilowatt to like the divided by square root of two because this is the line to line voltage. So if you want to convert to per phase divide by root three, right? Okay, so the 33 kilowatt should divide by the square root of three. Yeah, so if it's not given, if it's the voltage is not stated what voltage it is, it is a line to line voltage. So we so have to convert to the, to the line to neutral voltage. Yeah, if you want to do everything in per phase, you can convert that to the line to neutral voltage, yes. Okay. Yeah. 